Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we're joined by Walter Olson, senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies and author of many books, most recently Schools for Misrule, Legal Academia and an Overlawyered America. Anyone who follows your blog, Overlawyered, or your work at Cato or has read your books, see that you, you tend to spend a lot of time arguing against laws that seem pretty well-meaning. I mean we we don't want people being discriminated against. We don't – discrimination is not great. We don't want children being harmed by unsafe products. We don't want people getting fired for bad or silly reasons. So what's wrong with using the legal system to prevent these sorts of things? Almost any law announces itself in well-meaning terms and even the laws that seem most oppressive, if you go back and look at when they were passed, uh, it was usually with some rationale about uh, harm to children or harm to the helpless or protecting people from fraud or, or, or force, often libertarian sounding rationales. But I write about law and I write in particular about the bad things that law does to people, the ways in which it um, uh, unintentionally or otherwise harms the people who are exposed to its processes and um, deters a lot of good activity as well as bad. And so as with libertarian analysis always, you pierce beyond the initial announced good intent of a law and you find uh, combinations of uh, perhaps motives that were not announced at the time for why they passed it, uh, things that it's doing that no one expected it to do, uh, things that are obsolete, things that have been cleverly exploited by either actors in the field or by lawyers or, or even by judges to accomplish something uh, sneaky. And uh, law is very rich in that, uh, so much so that uh, having written four debunking and critical books. <laughs> I have enough material to go on as long as I might want should I write more. But at the same time, libertarians would say that the tort system, the, the system by which two parties sue each other for a, a redress of grievances against the private party is an incredibly important factor in order, organizing society, right? Well, I think part of what lends an interesting tension to my work is that I acknowledge that uh, uh, tort litigation is the correct legal remedy in some areas and uh, nonetheless, looking around at the disaster that was made of it in various areas, um, it makes uh, – and you can trace this in other areas too. I mean you, you can um, – uh, in uh, areas as simple as property law or intellectual property law, um, if the law is over-enforced in ways that – uh, involve penalties that are too high in ways that allow uh, opportunistic exploitation by the rights holder so that um, – I mean think, think for example of the recording piracy uh, issues and I'll set aside for now the debate among libertarians about whether or not uh, there is something wrong with copyright. But as assuming that most libertarians believe that um, outright piracy of someone's musical uh, property uh, is not a good idea, uh, how did you wind up with a situation in which um, grandmothers whose grandchildren had downloaded a couple of songs were being sued for $200,000 each? Mm -hmm. uh, here you have uh, not only a, a formally valid law but even one uh, – X hypothesis that libertarians are in favor of leading to uh, horrendous injustice because of the overuse of law because somehow or other um, the proliferation of cells – it's terrible to use this sort of metaphors but you know, of originally legitimate cells were allowed to, to e expand to the point where they began doing more injustice than they were fixing. In, in the realm of discrimination law, which is something that you've written about uh, extensively, uh, which comes up a lot for libertarians in general, but we're talking more about things like the Age Discrimination and Employment Act or the even the American with Disabilities Act and there's a bunch more. In the big picture, uh, before we get down to maybe some of these more specifically, where do those factors about – you know, laws meant to help are now hurting. Where do those start coming in with discrimination laws? Discrimination law, of course, is one of the great chestnuts about 
libertarianism because uh, it is one of the deal breakers for most of the non-libertarians out there. It is one of the things, uh, whether you are trying to um, get tenure as an academic or whether you are trying to be taken seriously running for office somewhere, uh, the career killer will be, uh, wait a minute, you don't believe in discrimination laws. And Richard Epstein and others have written – uh, at length about some of the theoretical side of this, but uh, almost everyone who's familiar with libertarian literature kind of understands the basics, which is libertarianism constructs its set of rights up from uh, voluntary transactions and contract, and if it's all going to be based on voluntarism, then uh, it is an, uh, uh, a um, disruptive uh, violation of that to have forced uh, transactions and forced contracts. And uh, again, Epstein and others construct particular situations in which, uh, you know, that maybe through emergencies or maybe through needed rights of way or whatever, you, you can get some forced transactions. But discrimination law aims to do much more than that. Uh, it aims to transform initially what seemed like relatively small portions of lives, um, our lives, uh, theaters and restaurants, for example. And I'll, I'll get in a minute to why the early iterations of discrimination law seemed modest and workable. Uh, and then it expanded um, area by area and category by category to the point where some years ago the Supreme Court was hearing a case against United Airlines by uh, half-blind would-be pilots who were not being hired because United said it didn't think it was safe to hire pilots whose eyesight was so bad. And no one thought this was unusual. <laughs> Everyone was talking about the particular details of the ADA by which they might win or lose. But no one was stepping back and saying, wait a minute, we're talking about half-blind pilots trying to get an airline to hire them that doesn't want to hire them. So and that was a long, long road. And it started with um, uh, a legal landscape inherited from laissez-faire uh, in which uh, there were little bits here and there. For example, there were uh, common carrier obligations sometimes and indeed uh, inns in the um, uh, where you could stay overnight might be under a common carrier obligation. What's a common carrier obligation? A common carrier obligation is basically an obligation to take all comers. And that is a germ of uh, anti-discrimination law, although obviously anti-discrimination law has grown to include much more than an obligation to take all comers. But uh, in the case of the uh, inns of old England, uh, the underlying practicality involved in the royal will uh, that innkeepers take all comers was that you might freeze to death. Uh, if you were turned down by uh, uh, the one inn and the next one was not for another 20 miles down the road, you might not even have a horse. So because of the uh, dangers of particularly freezing, secondarily starving, um, the uh, – uh, the royal will was that this one particular category of uh, uh, business, but not very many others, um, would um, uh, you know have, have to open itself up uh, in, in general. And there there might have been similar rules on on guilds and things like that ne ne negotiated. But the uh, as laissez faire swept through, the uh, these were recognized as rare exceptions and as contract law began to be seen as the generic model for all economic relations insofar as they could be, it was thought, okay, well, um, uh, this is a shrinking, ever less important exception to the fact that in general we have freedom of contract between uh, people. And then that was in the, in the 19th century. It still was pretty much confined to transportation and – well, what would happen then, uh, of course, the railroad controversies were important and there were some other controversies in which things like blocking of transportation access uh, meant that uh, uh, there was a revival of interest in, uh, look, since there is no point at all in being a farmer in some of these states, if the railroad will not deal with you, I'll put the railroads under a common carrier obligation. And, and so it, it gradually built up, but what happened – and it's – um, it only became important in the 20th century and indeed I think it only really mushroomed up around uh, the interwar years was the idea of using uh, uh, this type of um, exception to contract law to handle uh, – and initially I think the, the main thing that they wanted to handle was uh, the uh, oppression of Jim Crow. Um, there were incidentally uh, some other things such as can't we do something about the very systematic discrimination against Jews that was were going on in uh, uh, you know the 
American establishment institutions. But um, the, uh, the most visible area was uh, – the South was living under Jim Crow. It was this mutu mutually reinforcing system in which there were a lot of laws prohibiting businesses from being non-discriminatory. Uh, at the same time, there was enormous social pressure so that even when businesses were not prohibited, they tended to fall in line. Um, and there was fear of sheriffs and there was lots and lots of different things. And the impulse – was uh, you have a system that is so self-reinforcing at so many different levels that you need to take a sledgehammer to it and you need to do something really strong and really, um, uh, uh, you know, Unpre not unprecedented, really. Well, yeah, not not depending on the um, uh, you know subtle cooperation of the uh, the participants. Now, uh, once again. Uh, the uh, idea of public access to public accommodations, that will turn out to be an important term as we move on toward the obligatory wedding cake uh, regime. But uh, public accommodations um, were a pretty well understood category which um, uh, included for whatever reason places of public amusement like movie theaters. Um, but um, otherwise uh, restaurants and uh, lodgings were in there for kind of traditional reasons of it was difficult to travel if no one would allow you to eat and sleep. And uh, so the – and I'll introduce here one of the um, things to keep an eye on as the law changes because uh, most of the common carrier obligations, most of the public accommodation uh, uh, rules that we've been talking about are pretty easy to enforce. They have kind of an on-off switch. You look at the movie theater's box office, you know, are, is there a group of black people milling around saying they won't take our money, they won't let us in? Yeah, yes, then you've got um, uh, the problem you're looking for. Um, you, um, you know, it might go a little bit further if there is um, – uh, if the blocks are, are being uh, steered toward one part of the, the audience. But in general, uh, those laws were pretty easy to enforce with uh, not too much confusion between the intended cases and unintended cases. And that's one reason why when the federal government did ban that category, uh, although there was litigation for a couple of years based on resistance, uh, based on um, simply uh, you know, scoff laws, yeah. Yeah, um, that died down and there was actually quite a low level of litigation because it was so easy to tell whether people were in compliance or not. And uh, I said to keep your eye on that become, because that becomes ever less uh, easy to enforce as you move out to areas where you don't know who's in the protected category, uh, where you don't know whether different, differential treatment and uh, in you – know, I wrote a book uh, about employment law uh, called The Excuse Factory, which uh, uh, because it's about employment law, most of it is about one form or another of employment discrimination law. And one of the things that happened in employment law was – from an initial presumption to regulate the hiring and firing decision, uh, which looked like the do you get into the restaurant decision, um, they realized that they were moving along a continuum in which um, people could be constructively discharged. That is, their lives could be made so unhappy as employees that it was like firing them. So you had to apply some attention to when people were – um, constructively discharged. What about non-promotion? Well, that's like applying for the next job. So they had to scrutinize non-promotion. Well, they got to the point where uh, the cases that I write about, uh, the assignment of a less comfortable chair was disparate treatment because uh, the chair that the person wanted, they said they would have gotten had they not been a member of the protected group. And uh, wow, <laughs> yeah. And um, vacation schedules. Well, I wanted August, and I was given July instead. This is now the grist of lots of employment discrimination suits. Uh, is uh, differential workplace treatment, which can mean things like I didn't get my favorite vacation slot, although I got another one two weeks different from it. So. As the law moved along this continuum, and I'll, I'll get to the expansion of protected classes in a moment, but as it got to that, uh, what was initially uh, something that you could 
enforce with a half-time clerk. Um, you mean uh, within the company of enforce? Well, no, no, no. But I, I, oh, I was, oh, I was the more thinking about a, a – let's say you had a state that had passed one of these laws applying to movie theaters and, and restaurants and things. You know, well, if, if cases come along only three or four times a year where there's a real issue, um, it's uh, one of these enforcement priorities that you just don't have to pay that much attention to. You know, so every so often a controversy will come up and you apply someone to it. On the other hand, once you create – um, the possibility of suing over um, uh, finer and finer differences in uh, treatment in something like a workplace relationship, which is much like a marriage, uh, you know, and, and always has hundreds of, of dynamic, uh, you know, tugs back and forth uh, uh, between the, the, the parties. Uh, then you have uh, the need for whole. Uh, Departments of litigation uh, or whole administrative agencies like the New York uh, Human Rights Commission or whatever with large dockets of thousands of complaints uh, because uh, discontent about treatment at work, it is no news to anyone, is not new. It didn't come in with this issue. <laughs> Lots of people are discontented about the way uh, they are treated at work. And the um, – so this – was uh, one of the big stories, not as important for restaurants, not as important for hotels, but very important for the workplace, is that discontents that would have been there all along, discontents that happen even when no one is a member of a protected group, uh, people who feel they've done out of promotions that they worked hard for, uh, people who uh, know perfectly well they weren't treated fairly by their boss, uh, they go to a lawyer and uh, the lawyer will put them through uh, an interview uh, which – uh, or it may have them fill out questionnaires, which is partly intended to determine whether they suffered some sort of damage uh, and whether their employer is solvent, but also will be intended to fish for any information. And even if the person comes in um, saying, you know, this was an unfair dismissal uh, 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 and thinks at that moment that it wasn't because they were female or it wasn't because they were elderly, the lawyer patiently says, all right, you tell me about the unfair dismissal and quickly makes a note every time anything about age or sex comes up uh, and then begins probing saying, well, okay, you, you were dismissed unfairly. Did other people goof off just as much as you and weren't fired? And, and the person says yes. And Because um, every, worker, every worker thinks that, right? Well, <laughs> Pretty it's much. only human nature. Uh, you know, every, just as drivers in general nearly all believe they are above average drivers. Same with the workplace. Same with uh, most of what we do in life. But the um, – but the lawyer will be – uh, and, and they'll say, well, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, three other people got away with it um, uh, and they were really uh, misbehaving just as much as what the company accused me of. Uh, ah, and one of those people was a white male uh, under the age of 50. Uh, aha. And so the lawyer uh, will begin to you – know, first comes the bad news of you, know, you may live in a state where there is no legal remedy for wrongful firing as such, which is generally still the rule, although with some exceptions. Um, now here it comes the good news, which is you didn't realize it, but you've got a sex discrimination case. You've got an age discrimination case or um, uh, a uh, disability or a failure to accommodate your family leave needs case. Uh, and there are now so many different – categories that are protected that most of us fall into one or often more of the categories. I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, you know, so that part of the progress of civilization has been this, you know, learning to treat each other with more respect, learning to see each other as autonomous beings so we're not, you know, getting our pleasure by watching people kill each other in the arena and we're, you know, we're not discriminating against people on the basis of their skin color and it's like Things get better the more we move in that direction. And so isn't this just that enforced? Isn't that, you know, that we don't want we, we want to live in a better society and that means not dismissing people because of their age, not dismissing people because of their gender. So these these could be, you know, that sort of stuff does exist. And, and promotions we, too. And pro, I mean, don't we want to get rid of that stuff? Here is one of the things that produces an inter interesting tension for libertarians because by and large, and I know there is every type of libertarian and, and you can combine libertarianism with almost every type of views, but, but an, an awful lot of libertarians are uh, relatively – pro-modern, uh, relatively open-minded people who are delighted that we live in a society where women can now uh, aspire to any place their talents take them, that where uh, you know, 
racial minority groups, gays, uh, uh, you know, handicapped people, have uh, been brought into the mainstream of society uh, uh, in ways that um, are great for society because they bring in new talent and are great for the justice with which people are, are treated. So – that means that, uh, not speaking for all libertarians, but certainly a huge number of them, are privately cheering when uh, you know that milestone is reached of someone uh, for the first time uh, uh, of, of, of you know first American Indian who uh, is an ast- astronaut or whatever, and the. Uh, and the second thing that also figures in there is that part of libertarians' idea of how the government should run its own affairs, and this is obviously applicable in areas like uh, not just the operation of the justice system, but also government hiring for uh, the jobs that it employs itself, and many other areas of government action, is that we believe in the rule of law, we believe that uh, the government should not be engaging in invidious tr- discrimination, and therefore uh, libertarians are usually there cheering on the front lines when, for example, uh, you know, it, gradually it was uh, various levels of government announced that after all they were going to hire gays, uh, which for a long time they, they didn't. And so libertarians, having been in the cheering section for the social trend, having been in the cheering section for that part of the social trend that involves the government's own actions, all of a sudden drop out of the cheering section when it comes to doing it by legal force against the private sector. And again, as we know, this is one of the things that uh, makes people run and scream uh, at at the idea of identifying themselves with the libertarian um, intellectual movement. But what the argument has to be is um, first I think an argument of principle, which is um, uh, even sometimes – you know, I I don't want the – decision for coercion, the decision to introduce a coercive new class of laws to depend on whether or not I have to predict disaster from, uh, you know, the immediate introduction. Disaster often doesn't happen. You know, sometimes it, the law just sits there and doesn't do very much. We need to think about uh, how we treat each other, whether as uh, people who we can order around as if we were somehow in charge of them uh, or as equal people who uh, will sometimes believe that each other are in error. Uh, and I certainly believe uh, when I see people who would not let me into their business that they uh, they are in error. And yet I think I'm proud of taking the position that it still should be up to them even as I um, – curse under my breath or laugh at them or whatever I do as I'm turned away. Um, I like the idea that we live in such a free society where uh, they can do that if they are so misguided just as I can should they come around and want to do business with me, which also happens. So it's reciprocal on some level. Well, it is reciprocal and <clears throat> you know, one of the things about – so many policy areas is that um, eventually uh, the dog has his day, the goose and the gander switch positions. And you've seen this with, um, uh, for example, in uh, uh, the complaints that have been made against uh, gay bars for not letting in straights. And, uh, the, you know, there are, oh, yes, and complaints um, – uh, you know, m- more significant as a, as a social issue or as an area of litigation is a question, um, what do you do with a private entity, whether it be a university or an employer or whatever, that says, uh, look, uh, I do want to engage in, in reverse discrimination. I believe that uh, a particular racial group or uh, American Indians or whatever um, has been so disadvantaged and has had it so long for a while that, yeah, yes, I'm going to change the ordinary admission rules. And uh, that's part of what I think my institution should be about. That's part of my mission as far as um, whether a uh, uh, outreach based on religion or uh, um, uh, idealism or whether it be some basis of uh, I think that the experience of other students will be better or the experience of our customers will be better if they um, uh, meet every kind of person when, when dealing with our business. Uh, and one of the ironies of 
uh, disc- American debates about discrimination law is that they tend to be debates between two different groups, both of which claim total fealty to the uh, ideal of having lots and lots of coercion because the typical co- conservative reaction in debates about discrimination law is to fasten on to the reverse discrimination issue uh, just like a bulldog. You know, uh, that's the part of the issue that they want to talk about. That's the part they feel they totally understand and are totally confident in their position. And it quickly becomes a matter of you're not the real believer in ferociously enforced strong discrimination law norms against universities or against private employers. I'm the one who really believes it. And then the <laughs> liberal responds, no, no, no. I'm the one who really believes in you know, total ferocious enforcement. And well, and you know, libertarians are on the outside saying, no, no, no. Uh, you know, freedom is a messy thing. Uh, freedom means uh, when one side's getting its innings that we sympathize with the, the underdog that they are mistreating. Uh, fashions change. Uh, social pressures change. Twenty years later, it's a different underdog. It's a different side that wants to grind out some sort of exceptional uh, practice or, or push some sort of minority to the wall. Um, and in both cases, libertarians sympathize with that minority. They say, let people interact voluntarily and the minority and the underdog won't be squeezed to the wall as badly. Okay, So there's this principled objection but a lot of people don't share those principles or think that they can be outweighed by other things that, yeah, we, we don't want to coerce people into engaging in these transactions. But in a, in a perfect world, we wouldn't right. want to do that, but we but have we, this problem. We have these problems. These people are behaving poorly. We want to stop it. So what's wrong beyond that? I mean what's, it, what's the worst that happens is someone, you know, they get dismissed and they sue in court and the court finds that they weren't dismissed wrongly. I can get into the the horrors of litigation. I'd, I'd, I'd kind of rather save that for a minute because you raise wider and, and I think equally interesting questions about um, can't you be a little bit consequentialist about this or sure. aren't libertarians bound to lose if they aren't consequentialist? And um, you know, in a way, I think you're right, which is libertarians clearly have been losing ground and have been on the defensive on this for decades and it is in part because uh, people want a little more consequentialist um, uh, meat on the bone uh, in, instead of just a principled argument where they um, uh, strongly emotionally engage with some of the people that are, are, are being protected. Um, and I'd say a couple of things about that. One is that uh, this is all rather new and we don't, don't actually know where it's heading. Um, the, we know that it doesn't seem to have been stable to stop with the three or four groups that were um, – uh, initially protected, which means that from the standpoint of defending the practicalities of these things, uh, it isn't just the uh, 1960s um, uh, voting rights or, or, or public accommodations law they've got to offend. It is the wild stuff that is going on in the fringes of the ADA where they are beginning to agitate now for making everyone's uh, website um, uh, accessible to blind and deaf web browsers, uh, which means that you will have to take down your uh, personally published diary website uh, if it does. And, yeah, totally crazy. But again, you know, this is a moving target, and we should not allow the um, favorite move of uh, simply picking the um, beginning of it as if it were uh, st- stably stopping there and saying, uh, why couldn't you let this happen? What, what has happened is that it snowballed to a point where the practical results are, are pretty astounding. We mentioned litigation and the cost of litigation and uh, in part because the federal judiciary uh, has uh, veered in a direction of being um, uh, less pro-plaintiff than uh, it – um, was probably expected to be uh, employment discrimination litigation is uh, only a leading headache for business managers rather than completely having uh, swallowed up all of our attention and turned mm-hmm. into the national pastime. Uh, but it is a major, major um, drag on the workplace in many ways, certainly for those who are involved in it. Uh, employment litigation is um, a horrible thing uh, in which reputations are attacked both of the person suing and, and people, uh, the, co- the co-workers. Uh, careers are destroyed, very often the person who files the lawsuit and very often other people who in the course of the lawsuit are accused of terrible things and find that uh, their careers permanently stall out. Uh, it is really a, a quite a bad way of getting, quote, compensation to anyone 
one because uh, if people get involved in employment litigation, they tend not to uh, earn as much afterward and yet the amount that they get is years later and the lawyers take a lot. So it's a lousy, lousy system as far as um, uh, anything we would set up uh, as a kind of insurance to protect our own economic interests. And it's a lousy system, I would argue also. Uh, you know, most cases fail um, at one level or another. And defenders of employment and discrimination law say, say, you know, see, this proves that it's not really very onerous because defendants win most cases. This proves that we need more of it because judges are so hostile. Uh, they never acknowledge that perhaps the reason most cases are losing is that uh, most cases really were not all that well-based. And the uh, – but that's what uh, they would hear from a lot of judges uh, talking uh, – uh, in, in their breaks if, if they could talk uh, fr- freely about it. So you have great claims made for the social idealism of this sector of litigation. But uh, if you look at the actual people that are touched by it, you find a whole bunch of disasters and not that many uh, big, big successes. It also seems like one of the things libertarians should be there to remind people with the principles uh, that, that undergird private discrimination – is that the way to basically try and solve these questions is not to constantly go to government. It's what, you know, government erodes civil society in the way we, we don't just keep adding traits to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act and, and there's no feasible stopping point. Oh, they have a beard or they have red hair or they have two different colored eyes. When do you stop? What can you discriminate on and what you can't? And why don't we just talk about this like, like civilized human beings as opposed to going to court? Well, and in fact, just about the best advice you can give uh, people in the workplace is find a way to make it work out even if people are being somewhat unreasonable because that's – you're going to find the same thing wherever you go. You know, there, are, there are some people behaving somewhat unreasonably. Find a way to work it out without turning it into a mini civil war. Uh, but th- that's not necessarily the message that the law sends when it extends this er- uh, doctrine into more and more uh, areas. Now – There's another consequentialist argument that I wanted to throw in before we say enough of consequentialist arguments. We we don't need to worry about those anymore. But the the one that I find kind of fascinating is the – we know that uh, several of the protected group categories, uh, race and religion in particular, but you can – you you could find others, uh, are – Things over which people have fought civil wars, uh, not just in the United States, but also, uh, you know, turn to Eastern Europe, turn to the Middle East, turn to much of the world, and you find that um, people are uh, burning down each other's houses and um, um, uh, worse and murdering each other, and and and, and worse, and and that, um, and so the argument, I I think one that we should not dismiss out of hand because I think it may have um, more mileage as a consequentialist argument. But the argument that I've heard is, um, look, if we can be like countries A, B, and C that have different religious communities that in principle should be at each other's throat but manage to work out an arrangement and they have this set of laws, um, uh, you know, the, the whatever, you know, the Malaysians versus the Ch- uh, ethnic Chinese or the uh, Lebanon, believe it or not, used to be offered as an example of this sort of thing where the law carved things up between Christians and Muslims and several other groups. Lebanon, understandably, is no longer used as an example of that. But <laughs> I'm not sure it was because of the internal collapse of uh, Lebanon's way of doing it. But again, as Hobbes could have told us, as many of the great classical liberals could have told us, uh, if the alternative to a little bit of coercion is having a whole civil war, then that's actually a better consequentialist argument than um, some poor person will have to trudge down the road and find a different job. And um, here is where I would say uh, consider that uh, this is not a step from uh, not having the law to having the law. It is getting on to uh, a road uh, in which we are moving involuntarily th- through its expansion in directions we know not of. No one can really predict where this stuff will be in 10 years because no one 10 years ago would have predicted where it is now. Um, where is it going to lead us when there is more of a collision with religious liberty principles? Where is it going to lead us when um, – 
uh, groups that um, appear to have been uh, made uh, brought into more harmonious relations by it. Uh, maybe dis- you know, maybe some lawyer discovers a new way. Uh, and one of the things about litigation in an active area is that lawyers are always discovering new ways to deploy principles. Uh, reparations lawsuits, some of them based on uh, theories not unlike these. Um, you know, if reparations uh, begins to look as if it's going to be taken seriously, last time it did, about 10 years ago, um, the, uh, I'm convinced one of the reasons it shrank from public sight was 9-11. But another of the reasons was that um, it was an extraordinarily polarizing issue uh, which threatened racial progress basically because it meant that um, as, as one pollster put it, the um, – uh, people who were against reparations were so upset that sometimes it was difficult for them to continue with the survey. Now, <laughs> the um, some of these, and you know, it's it, it's very hard to generalize. Some of these laws have been introduced and have been followed by um, a lessening of tensions and exactly the kind of social peace that you would hope. Others have been introduced and have uh, led to the emergence of tensions between groups that had never been particularly upset with each other. Um, because we don't know, um, humility suggests that we not um, buy a ticket to a fast-moving train uh, to an unknown destination. So there's these harms to – if you enter into these things, it can be really hard on you. The litigation can be long and expensive and your reputation can be destroyed and similar with the employer. So it's – it can be very bad for the people immediately involved but are there – Larger effects, larger negative effects from having anti-discrimination law, or certain maybe some of the anti-discrimination laws. Well, yeah, we can get into the um, uh, the backfire effects, and one of the things that keeps this an ever fresh topic is that they, uh, it's always different from one area to the next. The effect of uh, sex discrimination law isn't anything like the effect of race, race discrimination law and the effect of age and disability are yet completely different. Uh, so that – to take one of the chestnuts that I um, use when um, – uh, after the passage of laws protecting race, uh, the rate of black male participation in the workforce um, declined. Uh, after the passage of laws protecting uh, uh, gender, female uh, participation in the workforce increased, although it had, it, it had been increasing anyway. Uh, in the case of disability, it plunged, and in the case of age, and I, I come around to age because I find age to be uh, a good entry point for the idea of unintended consequences in these things. Um, when age was added and you know, I'm, I'm not just being snarky when I say that we have not had a civil war based on age that we had to uh, atone for. Uh, we um, – in, in another sense, of course, there has always been a civil war based on age between people and their parents. But, <laughs> they, but people keep changing identity uh, well, between so the, the – So the, the, the participants combat- change, yes. Yeah, but between the combatant classes. But, but economically – um, this was uh, an extraordinarily bogus thing to add uh, because uh, the law in various ways uh, had held women down. The law had certainly held blacks down. Uh, that's the uh, paradigmatic case. But the law had not held old people down generally. Uh, if anything, it had arranged itself in their favor in various ways. Well, so before uh, – this is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which was yeah. passed in what year? Oh, when would it would have been passed? The, like the 70s. I think it was uh, 71. Yeah, um, 72. And, but, and then what does it actually say? It says you cannot – Well, the Age Discrimination Act, at first it makes a cutoff um, uh, of age. Um, you can't – a 24-year-old can't sue over the hiring of a 22-year-old. Uh, you have to be over a particular threshold at which you qualify. And unlike almost all of the others, it's not negative. Discrimination in favor of an older person is OK. Um, so they recognized in doing some of these things that it wasn't like the other categories. Basically, they were making it up out of whole cloth. Um, and it um, uh, – but among its other effects, it abolished uh, for all but a few exceptional cases uh, uh, what was miscalled mandatory retirement and what I prefer to call automatic retirement, which is a, a rule within an organization saying that at age 65 or whatever, uh, we – um, uh, you will become a retiree. And that had lots and lots of uh, 
unintended effects. I, I think they were unintended. But getting back to the rationale, you know, uh, old people in the workforce make more money, are richer, have higher level positions, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Where is the discrimination? Well, the, the argument was, well, only a few of them win the lottery of getting to be the CEO, and and um, it can be hard toward the end of a career to uh, stay, which is also true, as we were to find out much more so after they passed the law. But uh, so, what has happened to the labor force participation? Again, the first. Statistic that I turn to for whether a group was helped or harmed uh, are uh, more of them able to work for pay or are more of them staying out of the workforce presumably because they're not seeing attractive opportunities. That has plunged for people in the exact category that was intended to be benefited by a discrimination law uh, and especially for the subgroup of older male executives. They are the ones who are most thrown out of work uh, empirically. They're, they're the ones whose uh, employability has plunged uh, uh, in the last uh, few decades. And can we take a step back and, and talk about why that is the case? How, how does this law make – employing them less attractive. And is this yeah. the same – I mean you said that the laws – in every instance, these things are different. But you said we saw plunging rates with the disabled blacks too. and disabled, but not with women. So is there um, something tying these together? In the case of race and disability, there are – uh, what the statisticians would call confounding factors. Um, the, um, in particular, uh, taking the, the case of the disabled, they were tinkering with disability benefits at the same time in ways that discouraged employment. And if the ADA were doing all that it, uh, were promised because the ADA was rationalized on the grounds that it would pay for itself by bringing more disabled people into the workforce. We know that that was false. We know that it plunged instead of jumping. Um, figuring out how much of that plunge might have been due to the law is very difficult because the law was changing in ways that discouraged employment uh, through Social Security disability, um, the architecture of that program. But – the, uh, in the age case, there weren't all that many. Other, you know, there were certain changes in the Social Security program, but it's a much cleaner experiment of um, they changed that thing and the employment situation of people toward the end of their careers, especially in corporate America, um, uh, drastic, it has never been the same since. And nearly everyone agrees that it's not as good, that the, the old corporate loyalty thing of, gee, they used to give you a gold watch and a, a goodbye ceremony. Uh, well, think, why is it that they don't give you a gold watch and a, uh, a goodbye ceremony and you feel the, 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 you know, the room full of love of everyone you've worked with clapping for you? The reason is that, that used to happen at age 65 and they made it illegal for it to happen at age 65. The preferred method, and I'm boiling down a whole literature in the law reviews, is let the person stay until you can prove them incompetent, which means that every severance after age 65 now implicitly carries a message Hi, we found you incompetent. Um, we're uh, cutting you off because specifically you individually just aren't good enough anymore. Well, great. Yeah, so much better for morale. However, it doesn't tend to reach that point because large corporations um, realized – uh, some time ago that they could, uh, uh, did not want to face potential individual litigation from every person. Uh, they would do buyouts instead. And so they would come along every five years or every 10 years or whenever there was a recession and they would say, we're having a buyout and there are these very complicated rules and if you don't take it within the 30-day or 60-day window, uh, you might be fired involuntarily but we're not making any promises to anyone. And they could get people to leave and so long as all the departures were voluntary, it was okay to have all of your older employees leave at the same time. Um, so ways were found around it, very artificial, expensive, ridiculous ways that sometimes result in companies losing people that they hoped would stay uh, because of the ways that they uh, couldn't really control the, 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 the buyout. But in the meantime, what happens to the person who for whatever reason is age 57 or age 61 uh, and wants to um, make good use of those last few years of uh, high-level skills? Well, at this point, they become a litigation risk because, wait a minute, he's 64 years old and he wants to apply for a job with us and if – 
A, if it doesn't work out, or B, if or ordinary results of change in aging mean that in six years uh, we don't feel that he's uh, as good, you mean we might have to uh, have an age discrimination suit by a high-paid manager. And of course, high-paid managers were the group that filed mo- mo- by far most of the ADA or the, the, the age uh, suits. Uh, I don't mean to say that numerically most of them, but very, very disproportionate to the representation in the workforce. The lawsuits were coming from uh, well-educated, well-paid, um, mostly middle managers because CEOs had their own severance contracts. So they just won't hire someone at six, so, who's at 64 because so they, they're afraid of the lawsuit. Yeah, and, and but isn't that against the law too? It is officially against the law, but it's an unenforceable part of the law because so long as you don't let anything on paper, so long as you don't have any of the telltale things such as asking when someone went to college or um, – uh, anything you can't ask any age-related questions, and there are some surprises in landmines and pitfalls. But every HR department is briefed by its lawyers as to the questions you can't ask. And once you've remembered all the things you're not allowed to ask in the job interview, then basically it's very hard to enforce uh, the laws against uh, age discrimination on the hiring side. You know, it's somewhat easier if co- uh, companies are refusing on the more traditional categories because then you'll just notice the overall statistics. But it's harder to notice overall. statistics statistics when 64-year-olds are not getting offered jobs. And then uh, you mentioned this thing at the end there that uh, uh, we haven't really broached on either. Um, it might be a whole new topic, but uh, disparate impact uh, is another element of this. So we've been talking about intentionally discriminating. Uh, yeah. it, the, the general idea, of, oh, you're a woman. Uh, we don't, I don't like women. You're not getting a promotion. You're not getting hired. That's the thing that you know, a lot of people think is wrong, whatever. But there's another thing where the effects of, of neutral policies have discriminatory right. outcomes. And that, that has been um, the sad legacy of um, G- former Chief Justice Warren Berger uh, who uh, went along uh, with – uh, disparate impact uh, in the early years in an employment case. And it, we're, we're now having uh, the buildup to a Supreme Court showdown about whether or not they can use it in the housing area. But uh, just a few of the areas where it turns up, for example, um, <coughs> fire departments and strength tests or agility tests or uh, speed tests for rescuing a body from uh, a second floor. Uh, these have been relentlessly attacked for disparate impacts. Uh, you know, generally the case is the fire department would be happy to hire any women who could uh, pass the test. Who could pass the test, but women uh, would typically do extremely poorly at carrying a 250-pound dummy down a ladder and and tests of that sort. Uh, so the tests had disparate impact, and as a result. Because the way the law sets up so as to make it anything with disparate impact a broad litigation target, you can't always beat it, but uh, you know the, the law arranges to make it very easy to shoot at it. Um, courts would strike down around the country, um, uh, not always, but in many instances, would strike down these uh, strength tests, and uh, uh, this was very bad news for the public services because uh, whether you were um, uh, in the um, sanitation department, for example, and uh, the chest was changed so that uh, you could uh, simulate dragging empty garbage cans back to the truck. Well, of course, that's one task that you can give to some people on a sanitation force. But if you have to hire all of your sanitation people based on the ability to drag an empty can, uh, you, you will find that you know, you're not as well off as if you have a team, all of whom can carry a full can. Mm-hmm. And likewise with police, you know, the big impact with this, uh, the endurance and strength tests with police was not so much changing the, the number of women on the force because there are a lot of police jobs for which women are actually fine uh, 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 because they do not require upper body strength and different things. Uh, It is that you can't keep the puffing men who can't run the mile very fast. Uh, You can't discriminate in favor of the highly fit men uh, when it was just man against man. Uh, And and likewise – 
for all of these other areas. The dis- disparate impact uh, is so extraordinarily irrational. I was a bit unfair to conservatives earlier when I said that they only focused on reverse discrimination because the, to their credit, they've done a lot of focusing on, on disparate impact too. And it turns up in the current very hot controversy over criminal records in hiring because one of the big initiatives of the, uh, the Obama administration, EEOC, mirrored by movements in various cities and states around the country, Baltimore and uh, Los Angeles and others is so-called ban the box. Uh, And the argument is uh, because uh, inquiring about criminal records uh, or using that uh, to uh, – as as part of the decision process, also bad credit is another thing, uh, much the same way. Uh, It indisputably has a disparate impact because minority applicants are more likely to have trouble in those areas. Uh, So – uh, again, they are saying uh, it, it has disparate impact. They won't ban it completely, but you have to jump over a bunch of hurdles of proving direct job relevance. If someone has a um, conviction for embezzlement and you're hiring for an accountant, then yes, you can cover it, but not uh, the. Uh, when I wrote this up, uh, the example in Wisconsin, which had one of the earliest laws covering this, was uh, a, a recycling plant could not. Uh, that discovered that uh, a very notorious child murderer uh, had turned up in its payroll and that this was just creating a sensation uh, of uh, among other employees and among the occasional groups that would uh, visit the plant, although it, as a recycling plant, it didn't have too many outsiders. But it was just sensational. And uh, the Wisconsin system said, uh, uh, no, not, uh, uh, having committed a uh, spectacular child murder is not relevant to the tasks you were going to have them do. You can't uh, – you, you owe them a lot of back pay. And the um, – uh, so this is um, – you know, it's it's very frustrating because it means that more and more of the things that are indisputably relevant to uh, the, the quest for the best employees are kept off limits, and these may also backfire because uh, it is uh, believed in many HR circles that if you're not allowed to ask questions about an area, uh, you may simply steer away from it. For example, if there's a gap on a resume and you have circumstantial evidence, oh, the person may have been serving time, but you're not allowed to ask. Um, it's much easier to assume the worst, especially if you're liable for the misbehavior, than if you can say, please tell me what was happening to you in 2008. Uh, and then, you know, Maybe the person has a fighting chance to say, you know, it was just a drug possession thing. Uh, you know, I've, I've been perfectly fine in my probation. All the things you can't ask about, uh, but that might set the employer's mind at risk. They've seen the same thing on uh, disability and employment because there again you've got a case where uh, the – uh, labor force participation rates plunged and, um, you know, so a lot of people wondered, you know, why did they plunge? But one of the things that comes out of the HR world is someone limps into the office and they've obviously got something that makes them different from the normal physically. And um, the ordinary course of small talk in getting to know a friend uh, and certainly the ordinary course in seeing whether they can do a job uh, would be something like, uh, you know, tell me about how you lost your arm, uh, tell me about what life is like and how you get get around it. Uh, can't ask those questions. You can have certain highly artificial um, ways of asking. Uh, one of the duties of the job is to ask. Uh, with appropriate accommodation, could you do X? And you've got to really – be just that formulaic and then you kind of have to take their word for it even if you suspect that they're not giving you the right answers instead of just having a give and take which would put some people's minds at ease. And again, with handicap uh, discrimination, very, very hard to police the hiring side. So you wind up with what the Obama administration has just announced which is for federal contractors, there are going to be quotas because it's so hard to police the hiring thing. I think it's 7 percent. Uh, I'm going by memory but federal contractors Contractors, which includes most large companies, are going to have to uh, check their books. And there's two levels. I think they ha- they've got a smaller number for more severely handicapped people and a larger number for people who have things that you wouldn't even necessarily know are disabilities, but you find out when you look at the paperwork. I want to ask about causes for why things have gotten this way. I mean, in, to some extent, the incentives for certain groups are pretty easy to see. So for the, the trial lawyers, for the people who are going to be suing about all this, broadening these laws, giving more grounds for litigation makes a lot of sense because it's more money in their pockets. And 
certainly for some of these protected groups, arguing for more protection sounds good. Although as you've said, they often end up getting hurt by this, by lowering employment rates or whatever else. But there's another group that you've argued is is a driver for a lot of this really bad law and that's law schools. And I'm just – Trevor and I have – are not too long ago, both of us went through <laughs> law schools. So I'm, I'm just curious, how, how are law schools contributing to well, these Let's problems? talk about both law schools and trial lawyers uh, okay. or uh, the, the interest of the litigation profession uh, because they're both uh, big stories. And um, you mentioned that it was different from group to group. And identity politics, obviously, there's huge tie-in between the aspirations of black America and these laws and a, uh, you know, and some fit between the aspirations of um, uh, ambitious women and these laws uh, and almost no fit with age, for example. I um, mean, you can find a, a, an identity politics movement among the disabled, but you just can't find one among uh, old people. And um, – the, uh, and yet, uh, a strong law was passed anyway. Uh, pregnancy discrimination, where did that come from? The, you know, there is no identity politics uh, to speak of. I guess there's mommy blogs. But, you know, there, <laughs> but by and large, identity politics cannot explain many of these expansions. And some of the expansions um, are better explained by the fact that you have a coherent, um, well-organized group that wants to expand these laws in general, wants to find new areas. Uh, the labor movement, uh, although uh, sometimes ambivalent about the laws, generally uh, in things like pregnancy discrimination, they see an area to get more leverage against uh, employers. Uh, in Some of them see them as add-ons um, uh, and generally the feminists believed in adding on things like family uh, um, uh, marital status, although the actual impact of marital status as a category, it's not, not at all clear that it's pro or anti-feminist. But, but again, it sounds like it should be an interest of feminism. And, and they know that they're in favor of, of more supervision and more opportunities to, to have uh, d d disputing. And, and some of this is, I'm afraid to say, an economic interest to the fact that there, this is a large area of litigation, um, which has in common with most areas of litigation that the plaintiff side is extraordinarily intent on lobbying for expensive law and the defense side by non-contrast uh, is not particularly well organized because if you took away the law, they would all lose their livelihood. And so you have um, a lot of pushing from the one side and uh, not particularly effective pushing most of the time uh, unless it's something so obviously impractical that they feel in good conscience, look, there's going to be enough other things to dispute. Uh, you know, we, we can be against this crazy application. But the um, – and one of my – Examples on that was when uh, they were doing one of the many overhauls by which Congress has expanded this. And if you go back and look, the Supreme Court has often interpreted the law in ways that tend to constrain it, with the ADA particularly, but there were some other areas in which they simply wouldn't allow all of the ambitious legal theories. And usually what happens was, was within three years, Congress comes around and writes some omnibus expansion, reversing all the Supreme Court decisions, saying, yes, you can sue over all of those things, and while we're at it, here's ten more. Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of those rounds, while T Ted Kennedy was still in the Senate, the um, – there was uh, Wheeler Dealer negotiations with the business lobby as represented by Republicans in Congress and it had to be decided they couldn't get everything past the Republicans. What would they give up? And they kept – legal fee provisions which benefited the bar at the expense often of their own clients while throwing overboard uh, a couple of substantive things that would uh, have been of very considerable interest to groups of clients but would not uh, have been of, of as much interest uh, to the profession. So um, you can't dismiss the interests of those administering the system as one of the drivers. But let's get to the law schools because the law schools are independently and aside from any self-interest in money flowing in, the law schools uh, are romantically involved with this area of law. They, they pine for it. They, <laughs> they, they gaze you know, longingly they, they into moon, its yeah, eyes. They, yes. they, they moon at it <laughs> and they, um, you know, they are lovelorn mm -hmm. when it threatens not to pay them attention. And um, when I was, uh, you know, 
when I write about these areas, uh, I have often tried to uh, master the law review literature, at least the major, uh, you know, the, the Matterhorns and the Mont Blancs of the Alpine landscape. Uh, with the employment discrimination law, no person in the world could ever have read uh, all of the law review articles uh, because it is such an extraordinarily popular uh, area to write about. And it's not just the employment discrimination literature. It's also, um, uh, you know, feminism and bankruptcy law. It's also uh, disability and, um, uh, uh, you know, eminent domain. I mean, it's 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 an it's an effort to get, and you can treat this as well. Identity politics is strong in the law schools, and we know that. And, and this is identity politics' way of making itself felt with the rule against perpetuities and my group. Uh, but um, beyond that, it is also. Um, it's ambitious in that it's not just all ivory tower stuff. It's very much aimed at let's get going here to actually develop new causes of action and larger damages. And you know there is a a practical tie-in that there is social always, justice through the law. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so you have you know all over the universities are uh, you know law journals devoted to uh, uh, the uh, identity politics areas and and projects and. Um, uh, professorships and and so forth, you know, not all of which engage with discrimination law, but it it makes this, this enormously large and thriving uh, body of operations, which means that when one of these Supreme Court decisions, for example, comes out, the academic commentary on it will be more or less unanimous. You, you may find a couple of Federalist Society types saying that the Supreme Court did right by being skeptical, and you will see a mountain, an unreadably large mountain of um, credentialed commentary from the other side. Now, to me, this isn't just, you know, I, to me, we're getting at some of what makes this such a tough question for libertarians because um, I'm not the first person to notice that libertarians getting tenure in the legal academy tend to be specialists in things like uh, you know, securities law uh, or uh, you know, real, real property yeah, or – Business, corporate uh, law. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, uh, they are uh, calculating, I think, quite correctly that any pieces they might wish to write on identity politics and uh, discrimination topics should be saved for after they get tenure. And perhaps after they, uh, uh, you know, have good um, uh, moats and and uh, 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 f- fences around their 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 offices against student sit-ins, and <laughs> we we get back to the fact that this isn't just some peculiar growth only at law schools, although its growth at law schools has been very much fed by things like uh, Ford Foundation programs, you know, massive grants specifically to encourage law schools to develop in these areas. And the Ford Foundation has also been doing the same thing with history departments and with sociology departments. Uh, so it's it's the university more generally. Uh, you know, I don't blame it all on the Ford Foundation. It clearly has this life of its own. Uh, uh, I don't think I'm being too grandiose when I say that it is the substitute for religion in some ways of what makes people believe that the, the, the public good is the public good. If you t- collar someone not just necessarily in a liberal university town but increasingly a lot of other areas of life and say, I have only 10 seconds. Uh, what it, it, please name a legitimate function of government. Please name something that we really need the government for, something that would just be terrible if we didn't have the government. You know, all previous ages would have said, well, someone's got to arrest the, the burglars and, uh, you know, the, the footpads and uh, uh, the people who would break into our house. And, uh, you know, you might have gotten other areas at different times. And I'd See if I'm wrong. Go up to 10 people and ask that question and see if at least half of them don't say there would be all this discrimination. You know, who, who would stop discrimination otherwise? So for libertarians, this is, this is an issue to think about over the long term because it's much more central to people's self-image of being a good person than uh, most of the uh, functions of government that we might argue about. For people who are interested more in this topic, where can they find you online? My blog is overlawyered.com, uh, launched in uh, 15 years ago and uh, in recent years published by the Cato Institute. Uh, I'm on Twitter, both at overlawyered and at Walter Olson. That's O-L-S-O-N, no hyphens or anything. Uh, and I'm active on Facebook. 
Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.